Whether you believe in things that go bump in the night or not, there's no denying the power a good ghost story can have. And when those ghosts might be a little bit more famous, so much the better. While some of the spirits on this list might have more claim to their royal credentials than others, their stories all make for chillingly tragic tales. No list of royal ghosts would be complete without the infamous and tragic story of Anne Boleyn well known as the second wife of Henry VIII, Anne found herself in this position after catching the king's eye at court. Well educated at the French court as the maid of honour to Queen Claude of France, Anne was the perfect female courtier. She was fashionable, sociable, played music beautifully and danced gracefully, and understood the flirtatious behaviour of court. In 1526, Henry became interested in her, and Anne reciprocated, but only so far as to have a romantic relationship with him. She famously held back, as shown in letters from King Henry, written during their courtship, stating that she could go no further while he was still married. After securing a divorce for himself and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, Henry wasted no time in moving on to his second bride. Anne and Henry were married in a secret ceremony on the 14th of November, 1532. Although in truth, during the six years they had been involved in a romantic courtship, Anne had become a powerful and wealthy woman through being given lands and titles befitting a future queen, even helping to forge an alliance with France. She quickly fell pregnant with what promised to be Henry's longed-for son, and she was crowned Queen Consort, on the 1st of June, 1533. Anne encouraged Henry to go further with changes to Protestantism, and he doted upon her, lavishing his new queen with palaces and garments to signify her new status as queen. All seemed well, until the 7th of September, 1533, when the long-awaited son turned out to be a girl, the young Princess Elizabeth, while Anne was still in favour at this point, over the next two years, she would go on to have at least two, possibly three, miscarriages, at least one which was confirmed by court physicians to have been a boy. It wasn't long before Henry's wandering eye fell on Jane Seymour, one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, and in his eyes, another possible chance for his male heir. This was the beginning of Anne Boleyn's downfall. In order to be rid of Anne and move on to wife number three, what is now widely believed to have been an engineered plot headed by Thomas Cromwell was set into play. Although the rumours of Anne's affairs were not started by Cromwell, he used them to build a case against her with charges of adultery, treason, and worst of all, incest with her own brother. Many modern historians agree that the charges were probably completely made up, especially as much of the evidence against her came from a Flemish musician in her employ named Mark Smeaton, who was probably tortured to admit to sleeping with Anne. The courtiers arrested for supposed affairs with Anne all maintained their own, and the Queen's, innocence, and they could not be tortured to change their minds as they were members of the nobility. Nevertheless, it made little difference, and on the 2nd of May, 1536, Anne Boleyn was arrested and sent to the Tower of London. She was found guilty of the charges against her, including high treason, which was in two parts. A queen could be tried for treason simply by committing adultery, because of the implications of who might father her child, who would otherwise be the king's heir and Anne was also accused of plotting to kill the king with her supposed lovers. The sentence for this was to be burned alive, but in view of her high status as the queen, Henry VIII commuted this to beheading. An expert swordsman was sent for from France to perform the execution. The constable of the tower later reported that Anne had seemed at peace with the decision, unhappy enough that she was happy to see her life come to an end. On the 19th of May, Anne was led from her apartments in the tower to the scaffold to bring an end to her life. 
she faced the crowd with strength and courage, giving a moving speech in which she implied her innocence by appealing to those who might meddle in my cause. She also avoided criticizing the king, instead asking that the crowd pray for a man she claimed had only showed her kindness and who feared God. This was probably to protect her daughter Elizabeth, who she was leaving behind, the young princess just two years old at her mother's death. Removing her mantle and tucking her hair into a simple coif, Anne Boleyn's last moments came to an end as the swordsman's blade severed her head from her body, muttering a single prayer. What went through her mind before she died? Did she worry for her daughter and what might become of her? What is certain is that after her death, stories of her ghostly visage at various places she had been in life began to circulate. The Tower of London, the place of her cruel death, was an obvious hotspot. In 1864, a beefeater who was on duty near the lieutenant's lodgings turned and saw a white figure in the courtyard where Anne Boleyn had been beheaded. He shouted for the mysterious figure to stop and explain who they were, demanding they surrender themselves. No one, after all, was supposed to be in the Tower of London except for the guards. When the figure ignored him, the warder stepped forwards with his bayonet held out, again shouting that the figure turn and surrender themselves. When once again the spectral female figure carried on her path, the beefeater thrust out his bayonet, meeting only thin air. Stricken with terror at the ghost before him, the warder fainted. When he recounted this tale later on, he was threatened with a court-martial for passing out on duty. But luckily for him, an officer who looked out of his lodgings in the bloody tower saw the whole thing and backed him up. It is interesting that this apparition was seen by not one, but two people. In 1876, a captain of the guard of the tower noticed a strange light flickering from a window at the top of the Chapel Royal of St. Peter ad Vincula while on duty that night. This was the same chapel that Anne's head and body had been buried in a previously unmarked grave. It was also a place that no one should have been, as the chapel was kept locked overnight. Attempting to catch the would-be intruders in the act, the guard climbed up to take a look through one of the upper windows. To his horror, he found no human intruders, but instead a ghostly procession of knights, lords and ladies, all following a headless woman, whose form matched that of Anne Boleyn. The captain was struck dumb with terror and watched as the spirits moved silently through the chapel before disappearing at the far end. Anne is also said to make an appearance at Hever Castle in Kent, which was her childhood home. When Henry VIII was courting her, they often met beneath a great leafy oak tree in the grounds. On several occasions, Anne has been seen happily manifesting herself beneath the great oak on Christmas Day, perhaps waiting for her lover to arrive and whisper sweet nothings in her ear. She is also said to walk across the bridge over the River Eden on the castle grounds. And Anne isn't the only one of Henry VIII's wives to appear on this list. His fifth wife, Catherine Howard, also has a tragic tale. Catherine was a young girl who spent much of her childhood with her step-grandmother, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, Agnes Howard. The Duchess had several wards, a not uncommon practice amongst the aristocracy to educate and train their children in wealthy households, but apparently she had little direct involvement with those in her care. The result of this was Catherine's exposure to older men with no supervision, one relationship of which may have been abusive, and the other with Francis Derham, in which they called each other husband and wife. These would later come back to haunt poor Catherine. Her uncle Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, found a place for her at court as a lady-in-waiting for Anne of Cleves. It wasn't long before her pretty face caught Henry VIII's eye. She may have been as young as fifteen, and the king was forty-nine. 
Her uncle saw an opportunity to raise the heights of the Howard family and encouraged her to flirt with the king. After a whirlwind courtship, the uneven pair were married 28th of July 1540. Henry was infatuated with his lively, vivacious young bride, but it wouldn't be long before Catherine was swept up into a horrific turn of events. During her marriage to Henry, Catherine engaged in a close relationship with courtier Thomas Culpepper, later made gentleman to the king's privy chamber. The manner of this relationship seems to have been genuine on Catherine's side, as she signed a letter to Thomas as, Yours as long as life endures. Unfortunately, having any sort of romantic involvement with anyone other than the king meant an instant charge of high treason for the queen. When her romantic entanglement came out, so did her uneasy past, and Henry VIII immediately set about distancing himself from his teenage wife. Although there was no proof of a sexual relationship with Culpepper, one of Catherine's ladies-in-waiting who had helped the two sneak around admitted under interrogation that she thought there had been. It was none other than Jane Boleyn, the widow of George Boleyn, brother to the executed Anne. Culpepper was beheaded, and Catherine was sentenced to the same. Understandably for a girl who was so young and so full of life, she did not take it well. When told of what was to become of her, she became frantic and babbled her words, so much so that Archbishop Thomas Cranmer ordered all objects she might commit suicide with be removed. Her title of queen was stripped from her, and when the lords of the council came to take her to the tower by barge, she had to be forcibly lifted on, as she panicked and screamed to get away. The night before her execution, Catherine asked if the block could be brought to her room, so that she could practice placing her head upon it. Her state of mind can only be imagined. Clearly, practicing her death was the only way Catherine was able to feel some control over the situation. The next day, when she was led up to the scaffold, she was pale and looked terrified. However, she kept her composure and recited the traditional speech the accused gave before kneeling down. Catherine was beheaded with one stroke. But while her life had now ended, it would seem Catherine's spirit was not at peace. It wasn't long before stories of seeing her tortured ghost began. At Hampton Court, the last place Henry VIII had been while Catherine lived, she apparently runs through the now-named Haunted Gallery, screaming for mercy from Henry. This was the same place she was told the outcome of her fate before she was marched off to the tower. It seems Catherine is doomed to replay the moment when, according to legend, she ran towards the Chapel Royal, where Henry was thought to be praying, begging him out loud for clemency. Some visitors have also reported feeling a strange chill, or an uncomfortable feeling that grows the longer they remain in the corridor. If Catherine's spirit is real, it would seem she is not at peace. Our next ghosts come as a pair, the ill-fated princes in the tower. The two princes were Edward V and his brother, Richard, Duke of York. They were the sons of Edward IV and his queen, Elizabeth Woodville. When the boys were just twelve and nine respectively, their father died, leaving Edward as heir to the throne on the 9th of April, 1483. At the time, Edward V was staying at Ludlow Castle in Shropshire and he immediately set off for London. His uncle, Richard Duke of Gloucester, who was at Midlam Castle, first made his way to Yorkminster to declare his allegiance to the new king, before turning and beating with his young nephew in the town of Stony Stratford in Buckinghamshire. This is where the story begins to take a dark turn. The next morning, the Duke of Gloucester arrested most of Edward's retinue and had them beheaded at Pontefract Castle taking charge of his nephew himself. This, understandably, made Elizabeth Woodville nervous, and she took her daughters and Edward's brother, Richard, 
into sanctuary at Westminster Abbey. Plans were made for Edward's coronation and he was placed into apartments at the Tower of London, the traditional plan for a new monarch. Somehow, this must have eased Elizabeth's feelings of anxiety, as he was then joined by his brother. But then, the coronation date was pushed back, and pushed back once more. Strings were being pulled behind the scenes, and on the 22nd of June, a public sermon announced that Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was the only legitimate heir of the House of York. And just a few days later, he was petitioned by a group of knights and nobles to take the throne. It didn't take long for an act to be pushed through Parliament, declaring the two young boys to be illegitimate. This was based on the flimsy proposal that their parents' marriage was invalid. On the 6th of July the Duke of Gloucester was crowned as Richard III of England. The two princes were now kept in confinement at the Tower, and less and less was seen of them. The way in which Richard III had taken the throne meant he did not have a firm grasp on the crown, and it was obvious that Edward and Richard, Duke of York, were figureheads for all who opposed him. Edward was visited daily by a doctor who reported that the young boy was ill from some malady and was certain he was facing death. On the outside, this all looked very suspicious, and in late July, an attempt to rescue the boys failed. Soon, they made no more appearances, and rumours and whispers began that they had been murdered, and by their uncle, Richard III. He vehemently opposed the rumours, but did not produce the two princes to prove they were alive or demand an investigation into their disappearance, which would have helped to clear his name had he been completely innocent. Although he was nowhere near the two princes when they vanished, it was thought he had instructed one of his knights, Sir James Tyrrell, to conduct the bloody plan for him. Sir James Tyrrell did, under torture, admit to having killed the princes, but he was unable to say where the bodies were, and evidence given under torture was always dubious. There were other suspects, such as Henry Stafford, 2nd Duke of Buckingham. He was Richard's closest adviser and aide, and when Richard was away from the capital, was effectively given temporary control of it in the king's stead. A contemporary Portuguese document suggests the suspicions that Buckingham had starved the two princes to death in Richard's absence. Evidence to support this includes the fact that when Richard III returned to the capital, the two men had a blazing row about an unknown matter. Buckingham also rebelled against the king only a few months later in October 1483 and was beheaded without trial in November. This suggests, if true, the king had found out what Buckingham had done and had decided to punish him for it without making details public, which would threaten his own position. Or alternatively, Buckingham was not the guilty party and in Richard's absence, discovered what had become of the two boys and was horrified by it, perhaps a reason for his later rebellion. There was even a third candidate for murderer, Henry Tudor, later to become Henry VII. After Richard III had been killed at the Battle of Bosworth Field, Henry VII had solidified his somewhat weak claim to the throne by marrying Elizabeth of York, eldest sister to the two disappeared princes. In order to make her own claim to the House of York legitimate once more, he had the act making her parents' marriage invalid revoked. However, had the princes still been alive somewhere, this would have made them a threat, and the suggestion is that he would have had them murdered on his orders to remove them. Whatever the truth, the public opinion was that the boys had been murdered, even when pretenders to the throne, such as Perkin War, claimed to be one of the princes hidden away in another country. This belief in their murder persisted. Years later, in 1674, on the 16th of July, workmen renovating the Tower of London came across two small skeletons buried deep beneath a staircase. 
The two skeletons were the right age to be the princes, and they were reburied in Westminster Abbey on the orders of Charles II. Although DNA testing could now be done on them, for various reasons this has never been carried out, and the true identity of the small bodies remains a mystery. Such a tragic tale naturally became a ghostly one. The bloody tower within the Tower of London became the backdrop for these stories. Guards began to report seeing two small figures, dressed in white nightgowns, peering out from the windows of the tower together. When anyone tried to get a better look at them, they would fade from view, perhaps a metaphor for how their lives had mysteriously vanished into thin air. Sometimes, the figures were seen walking around the tower together, clinging to one another and sobbing. Other people throughout the centuries believed they saw happier versions of the children, spotting two young boys in medieval clothing playing together on the greens outside. In 1990, some Coldstream guards on duty at the tower reported on several occasions hearing children laughing from outside the bloody tower where the two princes would have played together in life. When they went outside to investigate, not least because it was night time, they found the grounds completely empty. Apparently to this day, the two boys are often found in blurry photographs taken by visitors as they take snaps of the exhibits, either following the intruders to their sanctuary around, or perhaps not even knowing they are there. The next ghost on our list has many places to choose from to haunt, as she was moved around so many in life. Mary, Queen of Scots. The only legitimate child of James V of Scotland, Mary was just a few days old when her father died, leaving her queen to a kingdom in tension with its neighbour England. At six years old, Mary was betrothed to the Dauphin of France, Francis, and sent to be brought up in France in 1548, while England was involved in a war with Scotland, the so-called Rough Wooing, a war imposed by Henry VIII to try and force a marriage between Mary and his son Edward. Mary and Francis married in 1558, and just a year later, Mary became Queen Consort of France with his ascension to the throne. But in December 1560, Francis died, leaving Mary a young widow at the age of just 18, returning to Scotland a few months later. Upon her return, Mary found the religious and political environment of Scotland much changed. The Scottish Reformation had happened in her absence, Protestantism taking hold as it had in England. Understanding how delicate the balance of politics within her own country and with England was, Mary decided to tolerate and maintain the religious settlement, becoming a Catholic queen to a Protestant country. In an attempt to bring peace between England and Scotland, Mary married her half-cousin Lord Darnley in 1565, a Catholic born on English soil. Their marriage, however, was strained as Darnley demanded he be co-regent, which she refused. But despite their difficult relationship, she found herself pregnant. Things turned sour, however, when Darnley became jealous of David Rizzio, her private secretary who she was close to. Rumours grew that the child was actually Rizzio's, and on the 9th of March, Darnley came to confront her as she was dining with Rizzio at Holyrood Palace, along with a group of Protestant lords. To her horror, they murdered her private secretary in front of her, stabbing him several times until dead. It's said that even today, there is a red stain on the floor of the room where he was killed, and no matter how many times it is scrubbed away, it always returns. Realising he had gone too far, Darnley switched sides, reunited with Mary, and the couple fled the palace for the safety of Edinburgh on the 18th of March. A few months later, on the 19th of June 1566, their baby son came into the world. This 
was the future James VI of Scotland and first of England, but too much damage had been done between the couple, and once more their marriage began to fall apart. After a violent bout of illness, Mary seemed to become more worried about the impact her husband was having on her reign, and in late November 1566, she met with a group of her nobles at Craigmiller Castle, near Edinburgh, to discuss what to do with Darnley. Divorce was an option, but it's more likely the nobles present agreed to remove him by other means. Lord Darnley feared for his safety, and not long after the christening of his son, he fled to his family's estate in Glasgow. He became ill, and it's suggested this could have been from smallpox, syphilis, or even poisoning. Whatever the real cause, he was requested by the Queen to be brought to Edinburgh once more, to a house at the former Abbey of Kirkerfield. She visited him daily, tending to him, and it looked as though the couple might once more reunite. But whether this was genuine or not, Darnley never got the chance to find out. On the 10th of February 1567, Mary visited her husband once more in the evening, before going to the wedding of one of her close household servants. Sometime in the early hours of the morning, Kirkofield was rocked by two explosions. Racing to the scene, the first onlookers found Lord Darnley's body in the garden, apparently smothered to death, with the body of his valet beside him. It was obviously murder, and Mary along with James Hepburn, the Earl of Bothwell, who was rumoured to be having an affair with the Queen, were both suspects. Shortly after, they both left for Dunbar Castle, and there are two stories arising from this. The first is that Bothwell kidnapped Mary and raped her. The second was that Mary was willingly kidnapped, and the rape story was to retain her honour and reputation after marrying Bothwell in a hurried ceremony, just 12 days after he divorced his first wife. The marriage proved unpopular with everyone. Catholics refused to accept the validity of the marriage or of Bothwell's divorce, and both Protestants and Catholics were horrified that the Queen had chosen to marry the man suspected of killing husband. Although she protested her innocence, it made it look as though the murder had been given the royal seal of approval. Eventually, the nobles turned against Mary, forcing Bothwell into exile and Mary into imprisonment. She was made to abdicate in favour of her one-year-old son, James, and James Stuart, the Earl of Moray and an illegitimate half-brother of Mary, was made Regent of Scotland until his young nephew became of age. She hadn't seen her son since he was ten months old, and now would never see him again. On the 2nd of May, 1568, she escaped from Lochleven Castle with the aid of nobles still loyal to her, making her way through Scotland until finally fleeing to Workington in Cumberland, England, by fishing boat. She was taken into protective custody at Carlisle Castle, and it was obvious that she expected her cousin Elizabeth I to help her regain the Scottish throne. However, Elizabeth wanted to avoid choosing sides, and so instead ordered an inquiry into the events around Darnley's death, including the Earl of Moray's actions, moving Mary to Bolton Castle in Wensleydale, to keep her further from both the Scottish borders and London. Mary refused to be held accountable to a legal court, as she was an anointed queen, though she did send representatives to her trial. There, evidence was produced in the form of the so-called casket letters. These were letters supposedly written from Mary to Bothwell, including a love sonnet and two marriage contracts. Mary maintained her innocence, however, stating they were forgeries. Most of the commissioners agreed the letters were real, but Elizabeth ended the inquiry, stating that nothing could be proven against either Mary or the Earl of Moray, 
and avoiding either acquitting or finding her cousin guilty, allowed her to keep Mary imprisoned while Moray went back to Scotland. But everything came to a head on 11th of August 1586, when Mary was implicated in the Babington plot and arrested. Sir Francis Walsingham, one of Elizabeth's principal secretaries, had secretly been smuggling Mary's private letters to himself and deciphering the code in them. The letters made it clear that Mary had sanctioned a plot to assassinate Elizabeth I. Mary was moved to Fotheringay Castle and put on trial for treason. She protested her innocence, stating that as a foreign anointed queen, she could not be put on trial as an English subject might, but it was no use. She was found overwhelmingly guilty on the 25th of October and sentenced to death. But it took the English Queen until the 1st of February 1587 to sign her cousin's death warrant, something she later said she regretted. On the 3rd of February, without Elizabeth's knowledge, the Privy Council met and decided to carry out the sentence immediately. On the 8th of February, Mary made her way to the Great Hall of Fotheringay Castle, having already written her will and distributed her goods amongst her staff the previous night. Her servants helped her remove her outer garments, revealing a petticoat and sleeves in crimson brown, the colour of Catholic martyrdom. She was blindfolded and knelt down on the block, but horrifically, she was not beheaded in one stroke. The first stroke of the axe missed and went into the back of her head. The second did sever her neck, except for a piece of sinew which had to be cut with a serrated knife. It was a bloody and merciless execution of a queen done in haste, and reports of her restless spirit soon sprang up. In Borthwick Castle, where Mary had tried to flee after her marriage to the Earl of Bothwell, her ghost appeared, but not entirely as herself. The story went that while at the castle, Mary's whereabouts were discovered, so in order to escape without being spotted, she decided to disguise herself as a page boy. Many visitors to the castle claimed to see a page boy with red hair like Mary's, furtively climbing from the window where her rooms would have been, before disappearing into thin air. At Bolton Castle, one of the many places she was held prisoner, Mary is said to be seen in a black velvet dress, slowly making her way across the courtyard on moonlit nights. Interestingly, an old legend used to state that there was a tunnel that ran beneath Bolton Castle to nearby Napa Hall, where her black velvet form has also been spotted. Another of her captive homes is also home to her spirit, namely the turret house of the Earl's Manor Lodge in Sheffield, where she makes her way slowly along the corridors and mysterious voices can be heard. But what of the final castle Mary stayed in, where she met her tragic and bloody end? Very little is left of Fotheringay Castle, as in the 1630s the castle had fallen into disrepair and was dismantled rather than be rebuilt at great expense. But one interesting part of it remained, some of the masonry for the walls and the oak staircase which Mary had made her way down to her execution were used to rebuild the nearby Talbot Hotel in Oundle, Northamptonshire. Not long after it was opened, visitors staying overnight began to claim they had seen the doomed Queen once more making her fateful journey to the block on the oak staircase, apparently unconcerned that it now led into the hotel. Light Disembodied steps can be heard making their way down, and some claim to have seen the Queen herself at the top of the staircase, dressed in a long white gown and nightcap, and can sometimes be heard crying. Apparently, she had gripped the rail so hard that her ring, shaped like a crown, left a crown-shaped indentation on the woodwork. Furniture regularly moves around the hotel of its own accord, and a painting of Mary's execution which once hung on a wall often jumps off for no reason. To add to this, 
A room at the hotel named after Mary also makes visitors nervous, with some reporting feeling clammy hands pushing them against the bed. If these stories are to be believed, it would seem Mary, Queen of Scots, was not content to go quietly into the afterlife. Our final ghost is King George III, who came to be known as Mad King George. The longest reigning and longest lived king Britain has still had to date, George III was a popular monarch. The public loved his moral piety and being seen as a family man. Unlike his grandfather and many royals before him, George never took a mistress and managed to have 15 children with his wife, Queen Charlotte. He was also viewed as caring more for Britain than Hanover, something which set him apart from his predecessors. In his ascension speech in front of Parliament, George stated of himself, Born and educated in this country, I glory in the name of Britain. George was also king during several conflicts. The Seven Years' War with France, the loss of the British colonies in America during the American War of Independence, and battles against revolutionary and Napoleonic France. He was also monarch as the transatlantic slave trade was banned in the British Empire and installed William Pitt the Younger as Prime Minister. It was a move that was popular with the public, but was also seen as proof that the King was able to appoint ministers that aligned with the mood of the British public, rather than relying on his advisers. However, in the late 1780s, George began to suffer from bouts of mental illness. George's mental illness, although unknown, was characterised by mania, where he would speak for hours on end until he foamed at the mouth, would write sentences of up to 400 words, or would suffer from convulsions and have to be sat on the floor. While porphyria was once a popular suggestion for George's illness, it's now thought, ironically, it might have actually been his medicine that would have been the cause of his illness, if not simply a genetic mental health issue. The king would also frequently repeat himself, and his speech became more complex, creative and colourful, possible symptoms of bipolar disorder. He also became more ill when two of his sons died while still very young, and the loss weighed heavily on him. Treatment for mental illness was simple at best, torturous at worst. But perhaps due to his own problems with mental health, George was shown to be kind and humane to those who suffered as well. Margaret Nicholson in 1786, a lady who believed herself to be the true heir to the throne, as well as mother to several nobles older than herself, ran at the king with a butter knife folded in a sheet of paper. She was quickly dragged away, but as he was unhurt, George III's only concern was that she be treated gently, as he was unharmed. Instead of going to prison or worse, she was declared insane, and instead spent the rest of her days in the Bethlehem Royal Hospital. In 1804, his illness returned after several years of better health. This led to him making less rational decisions that seemed less in keeping with what the public wanted, and he was soon at loggerheads with his own government. Nevertheless, he remained a popular king, and he was at the height of this in late 1810, when his illness finally relapsed for the final time. George, by this time, was almost blind from cataracts and had searing joint pain from his rheumatism. But this push into madness came from stress at the death of his youngest daughter, Princess Amelia. Apparently, he would cry for her, asking her to come save him, and at other times, he held the delusion she was not dead, but merely staying with a large family of her own in Hanover, and would always be well there. The Regency Act 1811 was quickly pushed through, and his eldest son, who would become George IV, became regent for the rest of his father's life. By May 1811, it was obvious that George III was not going to recover this time, and he went to live in permanent seclusion at Windsor Castle. As the years rolled on, 
George developed dementia and became completely blind as well as experiencing deafness. When his wife died in 1818, he was incapable of understanding the terrible news he had been given. At Christmas 1819, he spoke for 58 hours straight, talking in a jumble of nonsense. By January 1820, the 81-year-old king was sick with pneumonia and he died on the 29th of January at Windsor Castle. He had been a popular king, one who had helped the monarchy move into its modern state of being an example of national morality, losing its political power and enabling more autonomy for parliament. But his frequent bouts of mental health problems and the loss of several of his children before his own death must have been a dark and difficult thing to bear, especially when made worse by the severe treatments of the day. The stories of George III's ghost began just a few days after his death, while he was still lying in state waiting for his funeral at St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. The guards of the castle were continuing their usual duties when they passed by the window of the king's room. To their surprise, they saw the unexpected but very definitive figure of their deceased king. He was stood in his usual place watching the parade, and when the commanding officer saw the spirit, he gave the command, Eyes right! And as each soldier swung around, they found their salute to the king returned by his majesty's ghost. George was also spotted in the room beneath the library at the castle, a place he had been confined to for long periods as his illnesses grew worse. Staff working at the castle reported seeing the dead king staring longingly out of the window before disappearing into nothing. But most interestingly of all is that George III himself reported seeing a spirit at Windsor Castle, that of Queen Elizabeth I. As he was passing the library one night, the pale visage of the ghostly Virgin Queen supposedly passed in front of him. When he recognised her from her portraits, he attempted to speak with the spirit, who turned and told him she was married to England, and that she had not left it for this reason. It would be interesting to know if the two ghosts ever bumped into each other after his death, whether or not the ghosts on our list are real, their legendary status is enduring and a great source of spooky tales for many years to come. No doubt their popularity will never end, ensuring them an eternal life after death. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.